toolkit genes have augmented the body to the point where we start making our own toolkit, furthering the split from our primate past. As our kind ventured out to every possible environment, tools and technology increasingly made the difference. Yet none of this would have been possible without the evolutionary changes that increasingly chose brain over brawn. Nowhere is the difference between us and higher apes more profound than in brain power. But scientists have long wondered how evolution acted to increase cranial capacity by three times. Surprisingly, the key to how our brain developed may come down to a disease one that is built into every human today. When we first ran across it, we thought it was an artifact of our method of studying the structure of genes. But we realized that we all carry this mutation. Every member of the species Homo sapiens carries this mutation. Dr. Hansel Stedman was searching for a cure for muscular dystrophy. While scanning the human genome, he found a mutation in a gene that makes myosin, the protein that builds muscle fibers. The mutation specifically targets the size and strength of a jaw muscle. But how are jaw muscles and brain size connected? In non-human primates, like chimpanzees and macaques, the myosin gene is intact. No mutation. There's no question these animals have very strong jaw muscles, capable of delivering a powerful bite. And scanning the genomes of seven primates confirms that none have the myosin mutation. The genes that built bite muscles have remained unchanged for millions of years until us. You can see that letter for letter, it's exactly the same until you get to this one place where it's like the tweezers went in and plucked out two bases of DNA only in humans. The mutation causing a reduced jaw muscle may have opened up a new arrangement of the skull in early humans. There is limited real estate on the skull. It can house massive muscles on the outside or a big brain on the inside but not both. Most of the area surrounding the skull is muscle for closing the jaws. That's true as you cut right through this area of this gorilla skull. A Little bit of brain there in the middle, all muscle surrounding it. But a human skull is just the opposite, almost all brain, and only tiny holes on the edge for the reduced jaw muscles. Once the gene made smaller jaw muscles, it also slowed the fusing of the skull plates. In chimps, skull plates fuse shut at three years of age. In humans, the skull stays flexible for 30 years, in effect, allowing further brain growth. Strong jaw muscles and small brains were a feature of mammals for over 100 million years. From fossils, we knew that somehow the hominid jaw and brain had changed. Now, Hansel Stedman has found a possible explanation in the genes. So I'm not saying this, that this mutation that shrinks this muscle up buys you homo sapiens. All I'm saying is that, that shriveling up this muscle lifts an evolutionary constraint, allowing for continued brain growth that might otherwise have to stop. Scientists are finding some of the first clues in the hunt for a human toolkit. A cluster of control genes working throughout evolution, ultimately coming together in human form. Like no other animal on the planet, we humans have evolved the capacity to explore our own origins. To look inside, down to the deepest levels of our assembly and observe the machinery of life. Oh man, that's great. But just when we think we might be at the pinnacle, we're starting to learn we may not be. <laughs> we're
we're not the only creature Evolution's toolkit has been designing. It's hard not seeing Evolution as a ladder and ourselves at the top rung. We often assume that humans are outfitted with the best parts in Mother Nature's garage. Yet the genetic toolkit is showing us that there's no end to the ingenuity of life. Much of it's still waiting for us to explore. 90% of the living space is in the ocean, and every major animal group is represented there. My main interests are in the ocean, because that's where you find the breadth of animal creativity. It's all there in the ocean. Few get the chance to experience the abundance of non-human living things, as much as Tierney Teese, marine biologist and National Geographic emerging explorer. When you look at humans, well, we're kind of boring for the most part. We've got arms and legs and that's about it. But when you look to the animal world, that's where we see incredible creativity. That creativity will be put to the test. We could do some gills okay. on it as well. Maybe With her knowledge of animal diversity and Spore's amazing creature animation, Tierney Teese and Will Wright are designing the ultimate oh. animal. <laughs> that looks great. How's that? <laughs> Their first issue is locomotion. When you can make your own super animal, why settle for just two arms and two legs? I think we should have multiple legs. Like how many? Do you know about the echinoderms? Oh, I've heard of them, The yeah. sea stars and, yeah. the, and the, let's go to those. Sea stars actually move on hundreds of legs. They can go in any direction. They can lose an arm, grow another one. And they've got these incredible appendages called tube feet. And those tube feet, like a bucket brigade, will send the food to the center of mouth. It sounds like a city almost. We have like little road <laughs> networks and this transportation infrastructure. It is a little universe unto itself. Remarkably, the same toolkit genes that are active in making tube feet in sea stars also build legs in flies, lobsters, and birds. Similar genes, vastly different animals. And when it comes to choosing a mouth, our imagination has nothing on nature. Once you see this, you'll never think about abalone the same way. Okay. Okay, so here we're looking at the bottom side of an abalone. The shell is up here. All right. And this is the underneath. They've got that one foot. And this is the thing I want you to, to look at here. OK. Is this right its mouth? There. This is its mouth. Ooh, that's cool. Looks like some kind of mechanical Buzz grinder. Stuff. Yeah. And that's what we call radula. An abalone's radula is another one of nature's brilliant and bizarre creations. An electron microscope view of their teeth shows why its mouth is so adept. Metal teeth. And they can scrape through through metal even. Oh, so it's like a bandsaw. It's it just like comes a bandsaw and grinds and grinds zips and grinds. And grinds. Okay. Amazing, amazing animal invention. So Hopefully I'm assuming you wanted these on your creature. Uh, absolutely. In the radula is one of the most cool animal inventions out there. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a biologist's dream to be able to design your own animal. Oh my gosh, I love this. <laughs> to pick and choose the traits of animal groups that you most enjoy. And it also helps put in perspective what it is that makes life, um, you know, each animal group different. And why do some animals have this assemblage of characters where others don't? It's a great way of asking those big questions. Should we be able to fly? I think that's critical. Okay. okay. Let's add a couple wings. Having wings for us is kind of a problem unless we lose our arms, right? So we're basically, that route in evolution is cut off to us unless we were to readapt one of our current limbs. That's true. I mean, and what's interesting is now we're starting to understand the genetic programming for making limbs and seeing what our limitations are and what our flexibilities are. As creative as evolution is, species don't transform with the click of a mouse. Unlike spores creature making, there are limits to how far a body pattern can diverge. 
In other words, humans aren't about to start sprouting wings for the moment. Yet we're on the verge of knowing what all the genetic nuts and bolts do. Perhaps we'll start directing our own evolution in ways we can only imagine. You know, we are entering a brave new world where we can create devices which enhance our performance, robotic tools and so forth, but also manipulate our own DNA to change our bodies in important ways. And that, you know, deciding how and when and what to do is really an ethical choice because the capability is certainly going to be here very shortly. What we've accomplished is nothing short of amazing. We're on the brink of understanding the